Uh, Are you moderating, Jeannie? Uh, I'm actually not. Um, I believe okay. Will is, but I'll, I'll interject where needed. Awesome. I'll keep him in line. Uh, okay, there's Cindy. Cindy, are those new glasses? No, they're reading glasses. I wear them all the time. <laughs> oh, I, I guess I didn't ever see him with them. Hi, Dr. Kim. Hello, hi, Bernard's fine. Hello, hi. Yeah, I was like, who's Dr. Kim? No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I'm earlier because I got the recording. I'm like, oh no, I missed it. <laughs> no, no, I just wanted to check it out just to make sure that Zoom was running on this, this machine. That's why. That's awesome. I'm glad. I'm glad we got a chance to connect. All right. Well, otherwise, I would have worked on my phone. <laughs> I mean, I would have done it fine with my phone, I suppose, too. But Yeah. It's probably better with the laptop, though. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um. Evan, you can probably add a virtual background with your plain background. Oh, I have a, yeah. I created a bunch of nap ones and I asked Pat to make them available. And then I think Rose trumped me. She found uh, the Marvel comic book series of um, the Zoom backgrounds. Oh, I, just, right. I can't compete with that, Kate. That's cool. <laughs> right. Oh, hello, everyone. Oh, Evan, you're hello. so dressed up today. Hello. I try to, you know, have my routines you know <laughs> okay hi everyone else everyone we oh, have that oh, people so far um i i'm i'm seeing a bunch of people log in but uh we do have about 70 people registered i do know that there are people who just can't make it and then others who sign on without uh truly registering mm. Hi, Jim. Good to see you. Long time no see. Oh, you're on mute, Jim. Hey, Junan. I'll stay on mute, thanks. Okay. Oh. I saw this thing online. Um, I was I watched. Okay, this sounds really lame, but I saw a YouTube of another Zoom conference where they just um, where you would say hi to people, but you would look this way as if you're looking to the next box, or you could look down. You like as if you're looking to the next box. Like, like, like Brady that. Bunch. Like, oh, yeah, like, like Brady, Brady Bunch. Bunch. Right. Yeah. yeah we, like, I mean, hello. We could do like, that and videotape this and look funny. Yeah. So we're still waiting for William, looks like? Yeah, where's Will? <laughs> okay, just, just check in. That didn't work. So it's not, <laughs> does not work with my computer apparently. Show your show your cat. Cindy's muted now, actually. Oh, okay. Oh, bummer. I just said all that. I said, <laughs> I, sometimes I'm, I wave to people that I haven't seen in a while, like Donald, like this, because he's right there in the middle of the screen when I actually oh. am probably. Yeah, you. Donald, you're right in the middle, Donald. <laughs> I think he's muted. Some people yeah, don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited to see some folks who normally uh, aren't able to join us, but because I think uh, Bernard is from LA, we've got quite a few West Coast representatives. Wonderful. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, just for Bernard. We have quite a few people in the healthcare field, I see, like Ravi and Sherman, Sanya. 
I do see Robbie. It was Robbie. I thought I saw him. Hey, I'm here. This is Ravi. Oh, okay. Hey. Hey. How's it going? Good. How are you? Mm -hmm. Good. There's Will. Hi, Will. He's too busy changing his background. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Fine, fine. All right. Sorry, I'm in my kitchen. I'm okay. like doing four things at one time at the moment. So, how's everybody? Everyone good? Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Hey, I'm good. I'm I'm going to keep uh, the myself uh, mute because uh, folks uh, are replacing my roof and uh, a lot of noise going on. I just uh, don't impact uh, the the whole meetings. Okay. Sounds See good, you, Donald. Thanks. Oh, I can start the recording. Oh, yeah. All right. Just want to confirm that everyone can see the slide. Perfect. All right. So, Cindy, did you want to kick us off? Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, no um, Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Cindy Robinson. I am on the East Coast in Raleigh, North Carolina. I welcome all of our NAP members and their guests to a special edition of our uh, virtual check-in. Our programming it today is going to be uh, very timely. It's a conversation with uh, one of our members and one of our soon-to-be members. Dr. Bernard Kim. Um, I, we, we've been working uh, with Evan and uh, the President's Council for a couple of weeks now to make this happen because we knew that there were a lot of questions trying to discern um, noise from very um, significant and timely information. So today's session is really dedicated to um, all of our members who've been patient and then all of the folks on the front lines, um, healthcare providers, our first responders in um, this really unusual time of our global pandemic. So um, NAP has been um, trying to pivot to really address the concerns and needs of our members, uh, not just our larger corporate stakeholders who look to us to help uh, diversify and uh, develop their talent, but also to you, the members. Um, and we've been working really closely with the chapters to make sure that um, all of your interests are represented. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Will. Um, he's going to facilitate and moderate for today, and we'll be helping him with um, some of the questions. So he's got some uh, introductions and then some ground rules. Will, to you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cindy. So I just wanted to make sure that one, everybody can hear me. And yeah. then two, um, that everyone can see the slide that's up. It should say, what is NAP? Perfect. And then to uh, the gentleman, Mr. Lee, who's driving, I know you're listening, but please just don't look at the video. I want you to keep be safe and eyes on the road, my friend. Perfect. All right. So, um, so thank you again, Cindy, and thank you to Dr. Kim and, and uh, Mr. Lamb for being on today and, and really giving us uh, and sharing uh, us with their time and their energy and um, a lot of their knowledge and expertise uh, within the community. So I really wanted to thank you guys first off uh, for really joining us today. So I really, really appreciate it. I know um, everyone else who's on the call today is going to get um, little nuggets and a lot of value in terms of what you guys have to share. And so what we wanted to do today is, again, just start with kind of what is NAP, knowing that um, some of you on the phone uh, may not be either familiar or may have heard of us or may, uh, may just want to learn just a little bit more. So uh, in total, uh, NAP stands for the National Association of Asian American Professionals or NAAAP. It is a uh, nationally recognized 501c3 nonprofit. And really our purpose is to cultivate and empower our API leaders through leadership development, professional networking, and community service. And as Cindy alluded to earlier, our executive director, um, obviously with all the things happening with coronavirus or COVID-19 and 
of the last couple months, all of our chapters throughout North America and China have really had to rethink and reimagine and, and uh, to Cindy's terms, pivot in terms of what we're doing, how we engage our community, and how do we just ensure that people are informed, they have the right information, um, and have the accurate information that they can use to make their own decisions, uh, especially around coronavirus and a lot of other things. And then for us, our vision as an organization is to be the premier leadership organization for Asian professionals, and we value leadership, education, accountability, and diversity. So as we think about the leaders within organization, how our chapters look after their community and our programming, those are typically the four values, the four pillars in which we look after. Within the US, Canada and China, we have 22 active chapters. And uh, at the ground level, what we do is provide opportunities for our Asian communities to come through and really build community. So how do we build community within each uh, different market that we serve? So what we do here in the Twin Cities with my chapter here in Minnesota is gonna be a little bit different than say what Rose does in Chicago and different than our three chapters in Southern California. And so each chapter creates their own custom programming. Um, and then in addition to that, we have four different national programs um, that we can definitely share more information about at a later time, working with senior executive director. Uh, we have what's called WIN, which is Women in NEP. We have the NEP Pride program. We have a wellness program, which is uh, also, Jeannie, who's on the phone, is actually our national director for the wellness program. And we also have our business resource group program as well. And I'm not sure if Santosh is on, but Santosh lives in uh, Florida, and he is actually our national director for the BRG group. So that's just really NAP in general, the really fast, fast version. Um, if you want to learn more, go to nap.org, which is our website. Or if you want to get some more detailed information, have very specific questions, uh, email us at info at nap.org. And that'll actually go to Cindy. Uh, Cindy does a lot. She wears a lot of hats. Um, she, she, I think she's got a lot of superpowers. <laughs> um, so she handles a lot of her emails and she keeps all of us in the chapters really aligned and she actually does a lot to keep us straight. So that is now. If you have questions, contact us there. If you have general questions, feel free to put them in the chat box for us. So I'll pause there and we'll move on. Um, so today is really about um, uh, how, we how we're talking, we're going to talk about coronavirus, and it's going to, what we're going to do is we're going to bring in perspectives from kind of two different ends of the spectrum. So one will be with Dr. Kim, who is on the front lines. Uh, he's a e ER medical professional in Southern California. And then we have uh, Mr. Evan Lamb, who is on the East Coast, and he's on the research end of coronavirus, and he'll be talking and speaking to you a lot of the work that he's doing in that space. So what we're going to do is, and Cindy, I'm just going to need a little bit of your help, um, is we're going to put everybody on mute. And this is to ensure that both uh, Mr. Lamb and Dr. Kim are able to uh, obviously listen to questions and obviously be able to uh, respond to those questions to all of you. So we want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to listen and hear clearly. Um, if you want to share your video, which a lot of you are, which I really appreciate, uh, it's great to see faces versus just a name and a location uh, on the list, so that's great. And then if you haven't already, um, on your Zoom, what you can do is you can type your first name, your last initial, and then just include the city and the state abbreviation that you're in. So it definitely helps uh, both myself and Jeannie in terms of when we're looking through questions, uh, what we'll do is we'll kind of introduce you kind of where you're at and then state your question uh, for both Dr. Kim and Mr. Lamb. So those are the rules of the forum. The last thing is essentially we're just gonna ask questions. Ask your questions in the chat box. Both Jeannie and I will be kind of moderating that a little bit and we'll uh, be kind of tag teaming with uh, both of our speakers today. So that is it. The only thing that I'm going to do here um, is really say this. Um, know and respect um, the time of our speakers. Know and respect the audience and the people that you're talking to. Uh, really keep the questions uh, specific to coronavirus, um, things that are not around a speculative nature or political in nature. That's really my only ask. Okay? So, from there, what I'm going to do is uh, we have two of our speakers. So, I'm going to hand it off to Jeannie, who's going to introduce uh, Dr. Kim and then I'll introduce Evan, and then we'll start with questions. Sound good? All right, Jeannie, over to you. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I, I had to pull up. So I know Ms. Bernard, uh, my cousin on my mom's side, uh, and um, let me pull up his bio because I just know him as my cousin. No, I'm kidding. Very accomplished, I'm proud to have him. He is on the front lines. So he graduated from Tufts University School of Medicine and got his training as an internal medicine resident in Boston at the Leahy Clinic. So he's 
he was where Evan was. They were just talking about that earlier. He's happy to have left. Likes the California weather. He's now in California. Um, he did, he went on to finish his fellowship in pulmonary and critical care medicine, sorry, at the University of Maryland, which I didn't realize. So I learned something new about you. And he's been practicing in downtown LA for the past uh, 10 years. So he is a pulmonologist and also critical care um, in critical care. And he's at, he mostly works at Good Samaritan Hospital. And I call him Bernard, but Dr. Kim today. Thank you for joining us. Glad you're here. Thank you. Glad to be here. Bernard's fine for today. <laughs> Everyone uh, here, it seems like. Yeah. Evan, do you want to do, do, Will, did you want to introduce Evan? Yes, I will introduce Evan. So Evan, thank you for being with us uh, this, this afternoon or I guess this evening, kind of depending on where you guys are at. Um, but uh, Evan is actually part, lives in Boston from my, from my understanding. Um, he's part of our Boston chapter. Um, today he's a research technologist, which Evan, I really want to learn more about exactly what does that mean because it's actually a really cool title. Um, at Regan Institute, which is part of the M MGH MIT in Harvard. And from there, um, he, in his day-to-day -day research, uh, he specifically focuses today on the administra drug administration schedules for long-term treatment for HIV. Um, he's currently working on uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 processing and preserving patient samples and also developing clinical uh, essays to quantify the re body response to, uh, against COVID-19. So he's definitely on the other end of the spectrum on kind of more the back end how is it working in the body, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and so, so I'll leave it there and I'll pause there. And what we can do here um, is we can either, we can start with questions. So if there are questions out there, um, type them in the chat box. I haven't seen any yet, um, but we can, I'll pause for just 30 seconds to a minute and we'll let people think of questions and go from there. I see a lot of very friendly faces, but I don't see questions. Maybe they're all intimidated, or we could have we could have uh, Dr. Kim or Evan, anyone start off some with some things that they felt like they really needed to get across, like a main message. Uh, okay, we do have some. So I guess Newland started with something, but uh, Bernard, do you want to talk? Do you want to share a little bit of some initial thoughts that you wanted us to hear? You wanted to make sure that we get this message from you today. I guess just maybe just a little bit. It just, I mean, clearly we all, I think most of us have seen the gravity of the situation. We've, we've even seen even a speck of what's going on in New York City. Um, we can see that there's a very serious issue going on. And yeah, and luckily, I think for most of California, I think we were protected a little bit by the shelter at home that happened pretty early in our, in our um, geographic area. But um, just seeing what's going on in New York, clearly it's like we're, we're seeing cases, but not like the case that New York have. But, you know, we were getting a lot of sick patients. So clearly this is a a serious thing. And it's interesting because, you know, we do see a lot of people who are, don't have a lot of symptoms or almost asymptomatic, but then we see the whole gamut where we see a lot of sick people, people in the ICU also. And so that's why this is, you know, why we're of course talking about this because this is clearly going to be affecting a lot of people, unfortunately. Okay. So we are getting some questions in. Um, uh -huh. Let's start from the most recent. Where are people getting tested in LA? How long do the test results take? I do want to know that because my sister got tested, it took like 12, 12 days. And then once positive, do code patients go home or stay in the hospital? Uh, that's actually a very interesting question. The testing has not been great per se. So the initial testing would basically come in from hospitalized patients. But again, the Department of Health criteria was so rigid and strict that we couldn't test most people up to a few weeks ago. Now the testing is more commonplace. There still are actual tests. And actually, I think there are some drive-through testing that happens. But I still think you need some kind of doctor's um, orders for those kind of things to happen. So those do happen. Um, and I think this is still the RNA test, the swab test. So these still take anywhere from, I would say, at least 24 hours to three or four days. Um, we've had some improvement. Like when we first started doing this a couple of weeks ago, it was taking five to eight days. And we were, you can imagine we're blowing through all these raw materials, these PPE that is so, we're so desperate for. But of course, the patients are still on these precautions because we don't have results and it, it took like five to eight days. I think that's closer to now 24 to 48 hours now though. Okay. Um, why is it taking, some people are asking why was it taking that long? Yeah, that was, that was a couple of reasons for that, mainly because um, 
just getting the test was hard to begin with, but, but when the test was done and they got it out, um, some of our tests were going to Quest or some other third party laboratories and they were so inundated and they were so backed up, they just fell behind and it took a while. I mean, we had a patient that took, literally took eight days. I mean, eight, eight days. And imagine a person in the hospital for eight days and nurses are wearing masks. Every time they go into the room, they have to change their, their um, protective garments every time. And it, 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 it's, it's pretty tough. It's faster now, luckily. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, I'm getting all this uh, feedback. Yeah. Hey, uh, Evan, I think there's probably a question in here that's maybe uh, maybe a little bit more kind of on your end of it. Um, you know, as, as you've been doing a lot of the research in the back end and, and whatnot, has there been any sort of discoveries that maybe were expected or not expected? Um, and if you're able to speak a little bit more around clinical trials and, and a lot of the things that we hear from uh, both at a local, state, and federal level around different treatments and those types of things. So um, actually, I think that the most interesting thing has been uh, how we've been able to, I guess, test and leverage uh, existing uh, like things that have, like drugs that have already been approved um, for use in patients uh, and redirect those for use against COVID-19. Um, as for like clinical trials, I, um, and I have a few slides later that uh, I can go over that talk about this, but it's kind of hard to separate um, what's necessarily I guess, anecdotal uh, and what we can actually consider a true clinical trial and what we can really trust. Um, it's, the field is always changing and unfortunately, um, it's just really hard to just take one study at its word. Uh, Will, there's a good question here that I, I would like to ask, I think both of them basically. Um, we've heard both sides of the debate on takeout, okay? That's a very good question for me. Do one of you or both of you want to speak what the experts think about takeout? Do you mean takeout food? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, takeout food. Take up. It yeah. was my question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it's one of those tough things. I, I think what we know is that, you know, of course, you know, these fomites, I mean, these, these virus particles can pretty much get um, everywhere. And they're shed like by the tons by patients who are sick. But the question is, how does that really affect anything? And even when you're going grocery shopping, I remember Sandy had this, he had this little talk on how to clean your groceries and things like that. So I think it's all important. And we should do our best to try to, you know, close the loop in terms of being as clean and sterile as possible regarding this, because especially since we don't know what the exposures from the outside truly are, take us a little tougher, because I think eating the food per se is probably safe if it's, if it's cooked, things like that, but then the containers, everything else, you try to want to be as safe as possible, and it's going to be hard. Honestly, I don't think it's possible to close every single loop, to, to be honest, I think, unless we literally sterilize everything that comes into our home, but I don't think that's actually very possible or feas feasible. So I think we just have to do the best we can and almost be okay with that. But overall, I mean, I think, I think if you're careful, you do the proper things, you do the proper, um, you know, you don't touch your face after you touch all these things, you wash your hands after, before and after, you probably a relatively safe um, place. But again, it's, it's hard to close all the loops in this, in this um, infectious, um, you know, these things that could be all, everything that comes into our home from the outside. But again, it also comes down to, how infectious are these particles? Not, not sure if anyone truly knows. Now, of course, if we put, touch these particles and we touch our face, yeah, there probably is some danger to that. But again, I'm, you know, it's not like there's so much data out there that tells you how much of these particles are really gonna be that infectious and how much, what are the chances that someone's gonna get infected from something like this? And I would guess it'd probably be low, but again, it's, it's hard to know because there's not a lot of studies about it. And we can't really follow all these little infectious fomites from, from place to place and see who gets infected from it. There's no real way to do that. Yeah, I would, I would agree uh, wholeheartedly. I think that, um, I think it's, it's hard to really determine whether or not um, there's like, you can get um, COVID-19 from takeout. Uh, specifically on the virus side, um, the virus can, uh, can really only infect very specific cells and um, those are cells in your airway, which um, they wouldn't be able to access through the food itself. Uh, everyone that I've spoken to, a lot of the, um, the MD, PhD that I work with, uh, it's always their response is generally that uh, if you take the food, plate it yourself, and then just uh, clean 
uh, the packaging and then clean your hands, then you really do keep the risk at an absolute minimum. And honestly, like, I think relatively speaking, it is a, rel it is a little bit of risk. Okay. Um, how about are asymptomatic people really fully asymptomatic? That's, that's what it sounds like, um, to be honest. And we're seeing a lot of people who've been testing positive. They certainly don't have any fevers. So, so the people who've been using fevers as a, as a, a screening tool, clearly it's going to miss a lot of people. I mean, that's clearly shown all across the country, everywhere. But in terms of asymptomatic, I mean, it's possible you might have small little things that you could chalk up to almost anything. I, we're hearing a lot of people with maybe a mild sore throat, maybe a small, like a headache. We're seeing that a lot. And with in people who are afebrile, you probably wouldn't think much of it. You might think, oh, you're a little under the weather, maybe. But is this COVID-19? It's hard to know. And that's the difficulty because you have to make decisions on if you want to quarantine based on these very mild symptoms. And it makes, it makes it very difficult. But I'm sure there are people who have completely nothing impressive, either asymptomatic and no fevers and chills. That's probably 20, 30 percent of people is what we're hearing, maybe more. Evan, did you want to add anything on that one? Okay. Uh, no, I'm pr I think that really covered it. <laughs> okay. Um, this one, I, I feel like this is, this is interesting. So we are hearing that people can get tested, they recover from it, get tested negative, but then get positive, can be tested again for pos being positive, if I'm making sense. So basically, recover corona patients testing again for it and being positive. Should we be worried about that? I mean, how strong of a factor is this? So uh, in my experience, and again, this can change as uh, different studies come out, um, but I think this like, particularly, like I'm used to working with viruses that can go latent, um, as HIV is one of them. Uh, and it's not believed that coronavirus is one of them. Um, I think more likely is that people that are testing negative, it is a false negative. Um, and uh, without a second test to confirm that negative, then they are becoming positive. And um, it's not necessarily they were truly negative. It's just that that positive signal was not detected in that one test. Okay. Sadly enough, you know, just like with almost everything else in COVID-19, everything is kind of a moving target. We're, we're, to we're all learning as we're going through it. We're not even sure what that means in terms of if this is really happening, then where it's hard to interpret and not only that, let's say people end up getting um, antibodies we're not even sure how protective they'll be. That's how little knowledge we were actually, that's, we're almost like at ground zero for those kind of things. And so we're still learning as we go through. So it's hard to really interpret all those kind of things actually. So was 14 days really enough to self quarantine? You know, there's not a lot of good and hard and fast rules about that. Even our hospital is basically saying people can come back if they become asymptomatic and febrile after three days, but then they have to wear a mask. But, you know, we're kind of making general guidelines. We're kind of, I would imagine trying to use common sense where if you've been asymptomatic for a week, that might be a time you may consider coming out of quarantine. But their original guidelines were like, after you've, the symptoms started, you should be quarantined for 14 days. But imagine you've heard of people who've probably been symptomatic for those whole 14 days. And clearly those people are not ready to come out of isolation. So that's where, and quarantine. So I, it's also kind of a tough thing to, to say, but I think just use common sense guidelines might be the best. I would, I mean, some, some amount of time after your asymptomatic is probably the best. Uh, I could be wrong, but I thought, I think that the 14 days is mostly based on um, how long it takes for the symptoms to arise uh, if you are in contact. Um, and those symptoms, they generally show up around five to six days after contact, uh, but they can take as long as 14 days. And um, unfortunately, because as we mentioned earlier, the symptoms may not necessarily be extremely obvious or they may be extremely mild. Uh, you don't know um, if you started showing symptoms in that time. And then once you've started showing those symptoms, they can uh, last for a good while. Um, again, it's general guidelines um, and with the state of things now where you know the guideline is that generally if you're not essential stay home um, I think that we're on the right track okay um, I see so people do want to know how dire are the conditions at your hospital Bernard like you're I know you're in LA so you're not technically in the New York New Jersey area but how bad is it 
It's actually a very good question. And, um, you know, honestly, it's actually, I would say it's probably not that bad. Our ICUs, oh, we have enough ventilators by far. But then again, our, our hospital was probably pretty well prepared with ventilators anyways. We actually had a lot of number of ventilators that we had in, the, in storage, some disaster ventilators. So we were actually pretty good in that regard anyways. But we, in terms of the sheer number, like the, our whole hospital census is actually on the lower side, just like many hospitals in the Los Angeles area. And so the, the main thing that we were worried about was actually the personal protective equipment, of course, the, the PPE, which we were always a little short on, possibly running out. But then, you know, we, I think the hospitals come through. I think, so I think we have some of that. Um, so in terms of the, the number of rooms, the beds, the ventilators, we're pretty good with that. Um, the PPE has always been a little touchy, and, but I think we're pretty good with that now too. I think most of the LA hospitals are fairly okay. I think Northern California is a little bit worse than us. But I think, honestly, I think LA got the benefits of the shelter in place starting pretty early. because I think they were reacting to what was going on in Northern California. And we kind of just reaped the benefits of it kind of with less, ex we had less cases at the time when we started this. And I think we might have plateaued a little bit earlier. We were a little speculative that maybe this could be the calm before the storm. But it, you know, their cases um, have been relatively stable over the last week. And so it, we're, we're kind of hopeful that maybe um, that the shelter in place has really done a, a, a big part in this. Yeah, Dr. Kim, my name's Nicholas Diep. I'm, a, a, I'm up in Northern California, one of the hospitals up there. And yeah, we, I'm, we are on, the, I'm particularly, I'm in Santa Clara County. So we are a little bit on the heavier side of, uh, sure. of what the COVIDs are right now. And it's, I don't know how it compared to LA, but it's, it's, some of the hospitals up here are hit pretty hard. So, so yeah, I understand what you're definitely saying. I definitely know what's, uh, what the yeah. story is up here right now. So we've gotten a, a certain number of COVID patients, but the number of COVID patients in, in most of the hospitals in LA have been relatively stable. So that's, we're actually thankful for. I mean, to be honest, I think, honestly, I, I'm looking at the shipping places probably the most likely thing that did that. But clearly, obviously, this all was sparked by what was going on in Northern California. I think it's pretty clear. Yeah. We actually have someone from New Jersey or New York, the epicenter, who sounds somewhat frightened about just even walking outside. So she's just saying, is she in greater danger living there than anywhere else? I mean, it's tough. I think the I think the, of course, um, we, we should just use our common sense in terms of the, the social distancing guidelines. I think that's the idea. Most of those guidelines are based on the fact that we think that, you know, mo for the most part, if this is spread in the droplet manner, if that's really the case, which it hopefully is most like 98% of the time or whatever percent of the time, those social distancing guidelines should help decrease transmission. Um, but New York is a tough place because there's not, there's a lot of public transportation, there's not a lot of as many cars. So of course, that's why New York is probably getting hit so hard. And um, yeah, I mean, she should be careful, of course. Um, you know, the, the reason why these, these social distance and, and the sheltered homes are in place is just to protect people. Uh, we're hearing about a talk of peak, peak of cases, right? So coming back in the fall, what are your thoughts on that? That might be more Evan, but I'm wondering how are we exposing ourselves again if when we go back out of the state of home orders and then will there be a strong possibility of going back to something like this later on? I think a lot of it is really based on timing. Um, the unfortunate thing is that if we uh, remove those state home orders too early, then uh, people that have uh, been infected and don't know it um, are back out there and they're coming in contact with people again. and. Uh, if um, we are then able to, or if we, people are then gathering, then um, we're going to see a second peak. Uh, but I think if we are able to manage that and we're able to remove, uh, wait long enough to remove that stay at home order, uh, then I don't anticipate seeing one personally. Okay, that's good. Uh, let me go through this here, let's see. Okay, this is, a, I, I like this question. Uh, there have been a lot of coronavirus coverage, but are there any specific and important questions or challenges that you both feel that you haven't see, gotten, or that hasn't received the coverage that it deserved, perhaps, that you're seeing from the front lines? Being real about the things maybe you're seeing. Um, 
I don't know. I, I think just hearing what's going on in New York City and, uh, and all the hotspots in our country is just very humbling and also very um, eye-opening. It's just like when we heard about it in Italy, we were all on edge. We were all very nervous. But seeing this happening to our our fellow Americans in in our own in our own countries, it's, it's it's kind of it's honestly a little frightening. Um, and I'm glad they've if they've, the press is, and the media has been there, so we know what's really going on there. But um, and I think it's a good thing. Um, it's tough because the media has been kind of split on, on coverage of certain things and we have a lot of political biases in a lot of the media in general. So it's hard to really just, you know, sort through what's really good and what's not good. But at least when we're, we're seeing these things that are really happening, we, you know, it, it, it's very eye opening. Anything from Evan? <laughs> um, so I think uh, just to speak on my like personal discussions, the biggest misconception I've seen is um, people's ideas of how long a lot of these things take to develop scientifically. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people are excited about um, a vaccine that actually came out from a company that's like my neighbor at work. Um, and uh, you know, people are like, why is testing taking so long? And um, even fast track, like for example, the vaccine process can take well over a year and that year is important because you want to make sure that these uh, treatments aren't going to do more harm than good and it's going as fast as it can but um, I think there's there's such an appetite for it that people can get impatient. Gotcha. Thanks. Thanks Evan. Um, so I, I would kind of wanted to stay on, this, on the same thread around um, things that we hear in the media and that sort of thing. So, so Marinka, who's in, who's in uh, San Jose, um, is really curious about, um, so obviously we hear a lot of things coming out of our, our federal administration and a lot of other, uh, a lot of other individuals talking about, um, was it uh, chloroquine? Um, I forgot, I can't exactly say the medical name, but chloroquine and z packs and those types of things. Um, you know, from, from a, both on the front line and also obviously in the, um, from a research perspective, what are your guys' like uh, opinions or thoughts behind some of that, some of that language coming out through um, the administration and through the media? Because um, I think it can be confusing. I know I'm confused because we hear a lot of things, um, but if you guys can help us understand a little bit better from your guys' expertise, uh, what is right, what is not quite right, um, and how we should we be thinking about that? Um. No, I, I, I'll quickly start. It's interesting because, you know, hydroxychloroquine kind of got on the front page, of course, and we all know why. It's very interesting because, um, you know, we, we couldn't even tell, probably even tell you the mechanism of action of why this might possibly help, and we don't really know. So the, the interesting thing is with all the studies that have gone out, with, there's probably been a few studies, and they haven't been super convincing. Some have been for it, some have been not for it, so it's hard to really know. So we as doctors at this point, we're kind of, when we're starting, we don't have a lot of information so we we've a lot of us have been trying it knowing that there are side effects with you know qt prolongation things like that that could give heart arrhythmias and so on and so forth but if we keep those in check we've been trying it on some patients and to be honest it isn't a panacea it, it, i mean people who are very sick they're still gonna die if they regardless if they get those drugs or not could it help some of them maybe it's hard to know but honestly the data is not there um but you know we've been trying medicines because you know in Wuhan, China and all those other places, they were all trying all sorts of things because they didn't have much. So it's one of those two things that we've been trying. And um, we've had, I can't say we've had great results with it. And most of the data is kind of iffy on it, but you know, we try, we try. Uh, I actually think that this might be a good opportunity. I want to see if I could go over the slides that I prepared real quick, just uh, because I do focus, I think, on uh, hydroxychloroquine. Um, sure. So. Evan, did you want me to just uh, go to a specific slide or just uh, cycle through that for you? Um, if you can go to the slide that says challenge one and then, um, and then the next, I'll follow up with the next slide. Sure. So, um, yeah, the, I think the biggest challenge that I've seen uh, scientifically is that nomenclature is tricky, even for scientists. And uh, hydroxychloroquine has been um, a prime example of that. Uh, a lot of people were saying that uh, hydroxychloroquine was granted emergency use authorization uh, for COVID-19 patients. And I think the uh, misconception there is that emergency use authorization doesn't necessarily mean that it's an improved or endorsed drug. Uh, what it does mean is that, you know, the scientific community can study the drug for use. And if, uh, you know, there are these anecdotal um, instances where 
it might be working, but the evidence isn't necessarily there. Uh, would you mind going to the next slide? Oh, I can. I don't know how this works. <laughs> um, uh, it's coming from Will's screen. So, okay, there we go. Okay. Uh, so I particularly wanted to highlight um, the uh, one of the studies about combining hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin. Um, and this is a study that claimed that the use in combination against COVID-19 um, increased the efficacy and uh, decreased the number of patients that tested positive for COVID-19 earlier. Uh, the graph on the right, uh, this is represented by that green curve. Um, I think the notable thing is that the study isn't necessarily wrong, uh, but it does raise concerns. Uh, notably, the, uh, the sample size is small. Um, it was only about 20 patients that were given hydroxychloroquine. And that green curve you see, um, six patients actually ended up getting excluded from that data. Of those six patients, uh, three of them uh, were moved to intensive care. Uh, one patient passed away, one patient left the hospital, and one patient stopped uh, taking the drug due to nausea. And those are uh, at least four of those patients, I would um, venture a guess would say, uh, would continue to have test positive for uh, COVID-19. And I think the graph would be very different if they were included. Um, if you look at uh, the raw data, uh, specific patients uh, did suggest that there was a difference um, based on the timing of the treatment. Uh, but again, uh, it wasn't necessarily conclusive, and um, it's hard to uh, differentiate which data is anecdotal and what we can trust as a legitimate study. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and that's very true. And so, I mean, you know, we're kind of running as doctors with that kind of information, and so we. It's basically, we do the best we can, but honestly, normally with most things, that, with most medicines we use, there's very strict scientific literature that we, we rely on to actually make informed decisions. And in this case, we don't have those, in, those sources, so our, we can't really make really great informed decisions. So we're kind of just, in some sense, running by the seat of our pants sometimes, and it's kind of unfortunate. Gotcha. Thanks, Evan. Thanks, Dr. Kim. Um, so uh, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask, so there's one more question that I'll ask, um, and it, I think it kind of combines a few of them that, that are out there right now. Um, and, and once uh, Dr. Kim and, and Evan are, are through answering those questions, that one question, uh, what we'll do is in kind of like the last 15-ish minutes or so here before we pull a hard stop and then close things out, um, is really just kind of open up to other folks who, who may want to have just more of an open discussion or conversation that's out there. Um, so, and, and uh, the, this final question I'll ask you, kind of more this formal format before we open it up, um, is really around, so there's, there's some questions in here about, you know, patients being asymptomatic and talking about antibodies and those types of things. And obviously we've heard a lot in the media and from experts and others uh, about uh, getting antibodies testing and that, that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, and Cindy was also asking, you know, at some point, whether it's weeks or months from now, um, you know, we'll all get exposed, you know, the whole antibody question. So. If, uh, if you, Dr. Kim and Evan, can speak a little bit more about um, kind of what, one, what are antibodies? I think I have a general idea, but uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a data person, so I don't really know what that means uh, in the medical sense. Um, so we can get a little bit of education on what is an antibody, uh, what does that really mean? And, and if testing is done and we do discover there are some things around antibodies, um, yeah, in five, six months from now, would we be quote unquote protected? Um, and what does that really mean? And what, is that, what could that look like down the road? I'll try to answer this as best I can. I, I, I think it, I'm not an immunologist, so it's not my forte. But you know, antibodies are little, um, they're like little proteins in the blood that basically latch onto certain microbes or certain infectious agents. And then your body, when it, when it latches on, it, it signals your body to come and dispose of this stuff. So if you have antibodies for a lot, for certain infections, then if uh, that infection comes back to your body after it was, you were exposed in the past, your body knows to fight it off and dispose of it appropriately. Now, um, with coronavirus, you know, they have been able to test for antibodies and it, it, they've definitely shown that people definitely develop them. The question is, I think there's not, you know, the data's not great, but we've been hearing, I mean, not we, I mean, I've, I've read some sources where it basically says that 
sometimes the antibody response isn't super strong and we're not even sure how long it might last. So it, there's still a lot of questions up in the air as far as I'm concerned from what I've been reading, but of course, hopefully we'll know more as, the, as time goes on, but hopefully maybe Evan can respond to that a little more. But I mean, honestly, right now, I feel like the data is very sparse. Yeah, so um, actually in my HIV work, I do focus mostly on antibodies. Um, I'm in a uh, immunology engineering lab. So, um, I mean, I think the, that was a very accurate description <laughs> of uh, what they do. Um, but the most important thing I think is that, uh, yeah, all not, not all antibodies are created equal and not each person's antibody response is going to be uh, different. Um, and uh, so there, I saw, I think a question about taking antibodies uh, from patients that had recovered and um, using that as a therapy. And that is directly what I'm trying to do with HIV. And I can say that it is uh, extremely, again, like that kind of study takes a lot of time. I think the thing that we are uh, most fearful of is that um, these antibodies, uh, antibodies from one person may actually respond uh, negatively toward another person. And you might not necessarily see that response uh, for a few weeks. Um, and so a lot of the proper steps have to be taken uh, because once the antibody's in there, there's no real way to get it out. Um, in terms of developing, sorry, I think I'm, I lost track of part of the question. Um, but in terms of people, uh, I guess, developing their own antibodies and ha everyone eventually having antibodies, uh, I think that um, that approach would work if there wasn't such a high mortality rate in um, immune compromise in older populations. I think having that kind of deliberate exposure um, and just hoping that we all end up developing immunity while it would work isn't socially responsible. Yeah, I think that was the herd immunity that they were trying to get doing um, in, the United, in the United Kingdom. But I think they just realized that that would just cause too much, the death toll would be too high, unfortunately. So we, I guess we're down to the last 15 minutes. Um, did anybody want to, I know there are a lot of questions out there we might have missed. So anybody want to raise your hand, turn off your, or turn on your mic and ask questions to um, Dr. Kim and Evan? Hi, this is Eileen here uh, from Boston. Um, this is more towards Dr. Kim. Um, I kind of asked really, um, what can we as a community do to help support people like like the wonderful work and dedication that you are doing on the front lines, um, the med like medical staff, um, healthcare services. What can we as a community support you support you support you? Because I've been reading stories about how patient doctors and nurses can't go home or they have to stay somewhere else because they can't expose their kids or like lack of medical supplies. What can we, what can we do? Basically, I mean, just having us in your thoughts and prayers is probably a, a lot. I mean, it's true. I mean, I, I've been trying to self isolate at home in case I, I've been exposed as well. I mean, who knows? It's very difficult. But if you don't have your own bathroom or your own kind of garage, your own kind of system like that, it's actually very difficult to actually effectively self isolate. But I think the biggest thing is, you know, honestly, I, you see it on, online all the time. It's like, you know, we, we stayed at work for you, so please stay at home. But I think if, if everyone stays at home and stays healthy, that would probably be honestly the, the, the best thing for us, but just keeping us in your thoughts and prayers is, is always very nice as well. Thank you. Actually, along the lines of that, would you wear a, a mask, may, one of those face masks that we, that we make from home? I mean, how effective are they? I'm not sure. I, I think it all depends on the materials that they're made from. And I've been using it very casually for like, like around the, like walking the dog kind of thing, but I probably wouldn't use it in the hospital per se. Okay. Other questions? Hi, uh, I am from Kansas City and my question was, is there any information or any data that if you take a flu shot, would it reduce the symptoms or protect you in any way? Uh, so if I can um, start, um, the flu is a, an extremely different virus uh, from uh, the coronavirus, and um, 
unfortunately, if even if you have immunity against uh, the different uh, uh, strains that the flu shot is protecting against, um, there is uh, nothing to say that those that same uh, those antibodies that we talked about that the, they would be reactive against coronavirus. Um, so it's it's a very specific and targeted response. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, I don't think that there would be any reduction in symptoms. I would agree with that too. Hi, this is Sanya uh, from North Carolina. Just had a quick question. Um, there's obviously been a lot of back and forth and I completely understand um, the science background here. And so uh, about mask wearing and things like that. So what it sounds like now <laughs> is that you know, just being outside, especially like in enclosed areas, like shop, grocery shopping, something like that, that it is recommended to wear something. Is that correct? I think this is the latest guidelines are, but I mean, it kind of makes sense because I think they're the most helpful for people who, to stop people from spreading it. I think masks aren't great to protect you from getting these exposures, but at least if you, are infected, I think it, it helps reduce the chance of infecting other people, I think. So if you, everyone wears it in combination in, together, it might be a little better for the, the, the spreading rate. But. Sure, and I think that, um, especially, <laughs> I've been seeing posts, especially from my, my previous microbiology, uh, immunology teacher saying that, you know, make sure, like, just because you have a mask on or just because you have glove, uh, gloves on doesn't mean that you're safe if you're not careful about not touching your face or, you know, you're, if you've got, if you're contaminated, you're contaminated. So still don't touch your face, still wash your hands and, you know, um, obviously properly dispose of things so that you're not reinfecting yourself if you think you're safe. It's a false sense of security, so you gotta be careful. Yeah, I think um, the initial, uh, referencing the back and forth you had mentioned, uh, I think the initial guidelines were very much based on uh, where would the mask best be used. Um, when uh, a lot of news sources were reporting that uh, it doesn't make sense for people that are not infected to wear the masks, uh, that's because um, if those masks would be used for medical professionals and people that were infected, then that honestly would have resolved things. Um, but now that uh, there is community spread, you don't necessarily know where uh, that infection is coming from. This is where um, those masks are becoming uh, more useful. And that's why now those guidelines are changing. Um, I think I saw something about um, droplets uh, in the chat, and I wanted to touch on that. Um, the So there was a study I talked about um, aerosols, and unfortunately, uh, the, it said that aerosols, there, was, there were three hours after the aerosol that um, the virus would stick around. But uh, the way these droplets versus aerosols, again, it's that very tricky language, is down to like the size of the particle. And um, the droplets are larger particles. So they should generally, I guess, fall out of the air and be um, more or less uh, captured by masks more than the data from the aerosol would suggest. Hey, this is Cindy. I wanted to uh, mention one of the very first uh, webinars I went, I started uh, attending was one for uh, OCA and Asian American Journal Association reporter Richard Bowie interviewing Dr. David Ho. Um, if you all are as old as I am, you'll know that Dr. Ho was um, the researcher involved with uh, kind of uh, figuring out a little bit more about the uh, HIV virus. So. One of the things he said was interesting to me was he said the masks are not doing anything, in his opinion, uh, the ones that are not N95, will not do anything to prevent the transmission of um, the virus and aerosol or droplets or anything. But he interrupted himself and said, socially, if everybody starts wearing masks, it will remove the stigma for the people who are truly infected or the people who are concerned. And that maybe that's a good thing that if everyone's wearing masks then we can we can help fight the disease together i thought that was really um a, a neat comment i don't know if people picked up on it as i did in the call hmm. 
that seems like an inter interesting point, actually. I, I kind of like that. I, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm so fatalistic if they do that, like so little. I think they do do a little bit. Otherwise, you know, I mean, because otherwise we would be only using N95s in the hospital. We still use surgical masks and things like that. So I think they do a little bit. I'm sure there's not a lot of data on how much they do, unfortunately. So. I do agree about the point with the social stigma though. Um, I was talking to my parents and they were like, oh, um, this wouldn't have ever, never have happened if you know, masks were more widely available. Why aren't they more widely available? Uh, it clearly worked in Asia. And I had to explain to them, I was like, it's not culturally a thing here. So people aren't going to seek out masks and supply chains won't be there because there wasn't a demand for it. I think we're nearing the end, but I really like this one comment or this one question and wanted to pose it just as a way to end on a positive note that do you, do both of you see a beacon of hope on the horizon, something that is encouraging in all of this, aside from time? I mean, everyone first or? Uh, I can go first. Um, I think for me, it's been really inspiring seeing uh, the research community come together over this. Um, we are obviously, we're taking a lot of precautions where there's an oversight board for my particular research that is determining what is necessary and what isn't. Um, but uh, the collaborations across the city and honestly across the country have been incredibly giving, um, everyone sharing information. And I think at the time I last checked, there were over 200 clinical trials. Um, and yeah, everyone's working hard to get this done. Yeah, I, have to, I have to agree with Evan on that. I mean, you know, the medical community is obviously all united because we're all, um, we're seeing what's happening to our, our brethren in other parts of the country and everyone's working together trying to get everything, you know, try to tr treat the sick people. So um, that's pretty amazing. Um, it's tough though. I think we're in it for the long haul, so we'll 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 try to do the best we can. I just realized we I realized we have more time than I thought. I thought it was five fifty eight. Um, any other last minute questions? But that that's that's encouraging to hear that uh, we're seeing. Um, hey, this is Harris from Boston. I have a question um, for maybe Dr. Kim. What's the kind of timeline for a patient who has developed symptoms for COVID nineteen? What's the timeline and what can they expect to see in terms of symptoms from when they got it all the way to recovery? Unfortunately, that's a very hard question to um, answer. And the reason is because everyone responds so differently. Um, we've seen people who get some mild disease, they get fever for a couple of days, it goes away and then they feel better. We've seen people who literally kind of linger for like a week and then they get very sick and then they end up going to the ER and getting intubated and then literally dying in a few days. So it's actually kind of hard to, to judge. We, I, I think we know people, the sicker ones are the ones who start getting the trouble breathing and things like that. But they, even that can take almost a week to develop in some people. So it's a very hard question to answer because everyone is responding fairly differently. We do see like some classic cases of people linger for a week, they smolder for a week and then they get really sick. They smolder for a week and they start getting better. But ultimately it's, it's really hard to nail it down because you just see so many presentations of mild cases and, and severe cases and it's really it's really honestly it's very difficult awesome thank you dr kim and evan want to um just thank you guys again and if we can give uh, these guys a digital or a zoom round of applause if that's a uh -huh. if that's a thing if it's not i'm going to make it a thing um but I really, I really appreciate both of you guys taking an hour out of your day to, to field some questions um, and really, you know, just put some, some of our members across the country at a little bit of ease and really just getting them some answers uh, directly uh, versus trying to figure out what's right and wrong on Google or social media or somewhere on the, on the wide, World Wide Web, if that's what we even call it again at this point. So again, I want to thank both of you, uh, Dr. Bernard and, and Mr. Lamb for being here. I really appreciate your time. Um, and the last thing that I know that we wanted to go through real quick is uh, I'll hand it over to Cindy to just wrap us up and finish us off. Um, but we just had just a few short announcements on programs for the rest uh, for the rest of April going to May. 
Thanks, Will. So yes, I mean, today's uh, topic was very sobering and also very timely. Um, as we go into the rest of April, you know that all of our programs have to be virtual going forward. And so we're trying to share resources in terms of speakers and, and technology. Um, in next week, we'll be announcing that uh, NAP has signed a partnership with APIA scholars. Uh, they give the largest number of scholarships to first generation and Asian American um, college students. And the, the SMART mentoring program is an e-mentoring program by design. It was never meant to be face-to-face. Uh, -face. So uh, those of you within NAP who have at least five years of post-college experience, uh, we would love to have you sign up. It's a six month, one hour a month commitment. So I think it's a pretty manageable. If you want to have more than one mentee, you can indicate that, but you would basically start with a, a intake form to describe yourself as a potential men, uh, mentor, what, in, what interests you have both um, academically and personally um, and professionally. Um, there is a program coming from Nat Pride on April 21st called Pronouns 101. It is a uh, video um, and I think it's a video pr uh, presentation with the Q&A and this will be available to I think all NAP members and in the future available to our corporate stakeholders and sponsors. Um, then San Jose is doing an entrepreneurship series and it's a little bit more about COVID-19 uh, small business impacts and the economic relief programs that are available. Um, and then we will kick off May uh, with two things. First, we're going to be opening up our nominations for the NAP 100 Inspire and Pride Award um, program, and that will run May 1st through the 31st. Uh, additionally, for Heritage Month, we'll have four programs on each Wednesday of the month. Um, we'll, we'll get more information out about that. Um, you'll also hear that we're going to be featuring um, our own chapter members or leaders as rising stars. We're looking for people who are probably one or two years into their uh, NAP membership or journey and featuring them uh, for not only the work they do within our organization, but in their local communities, either in their professions or in their community work. So we hope that you will nominate your friends, um, people that you've admired um, in your chapters. That is the, that's all for the program announcements. Look for more online at nap.org. And again, thank you, Dr. Kim, Thank you, Mr. Lamb, and everybody who came today. We, we hit a high of 69 participants. That's great for us. Um, and we hope to, that we will continue serving your interests and needs. All right, um, I'm signing it's off. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'll Thanks put the report you. online. Bye, guys. Thanks, everyone. Be safe, everybody. All right. Yeah, be safe. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> be safe. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs>